Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE Conversations here in Palo Alto Studios for theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, the co-host of theCUBE, co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media. We are here for Thought Leader Thursday with Mitzi Chang. She's a securities attorney and partner at Goodwin, formerly Goodwin Proctor. Goodwin Proctor is the name. Again, uh, great to have you on. Thanks for coming in, talking about uh, some of the securities around blockchain, ICOs. You guys are doing a lot of work. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. So obviously, um, blockchain is the hottest thing we're seeing. AI obviously is, is hot as well. IoT, all this is about the, a new decentralized internet. Um, and it's the Wild West, and we know because we're looking at doing our blockchain and, and tokens for the cube and all that good stuff. So we're totally love, love the new environment. Everyone, all the like tier one entrepreneurs go, are licking their chops and go, wow, man, good action. And a lot of the thought leaders are saying this is a fundamental shift. So it's cool, we get that. But now, okay is the technology ahead of the law, and just today the news is breaking, the SEC is now putting a clamp down on a new thing, celebrity endorsements into ICOs, initial coin offerings. So, you know, you're a securities attorney, you have to sit back there and like, why are these deals together? Right. What's going on? I mean, so is the law behind the tech? How are you guys managing it? What's the flow look like for you? Yeah, I mean, I think that the law is almost always behind the technology, right? That's just how, it works. Um, I mean, from our perspective, you know, we represent you know tons of companies on normal securities law or securities issuances, mm -hmm. and this can um, be similar depending mm -hmm. on how the token is structured. So, you know, the SEC said in, in its July guidance that tokens can be securities depending on the facts. So, part of what we do as lawyers is review the facts of the token, right? What, it, what does the token do? How do you um, treat the token? How are you issuing the token? How are you marketing the token? Um, are there securities-like features of the token? So for example, mm -hmm. Um, you know, is it, does it have profit sharing features? Does it, does it have voting features? Those are pretty obviously more security-like features. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, in the token ecosystem, are you treating it like you would equity? So for mm -hmm. example, you know, are you um, putting vesting conditions on there? Are you marketing it to VCs who may never use your network? Those are <laughs> some factors yeah. that make it look like more security versus a utility. You guys also, I mean, I've, I've been in Silicon Valley now 18 years um, and been an entrepreneur for longer. And the you know, entrepreneur's always, you know, three feet in a cloud of dust, making, breaking things in the, in, you know, bull in the china shop, as they say, you know, just, and, and have to get to the lawyers to kind of clean things up or set things straight. Securities is a known practice, but now there's some kind of bumps on the road, but still people are moving forward. So I got to ask you, what's the test? I mean, we hear things like the Howey test. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are some of the things that entrepreneurs should know around where to pay attention? kind of where to put their head down and, and drive, because there are known practices on the security side, you mentioned a few of them, but right. where, where's, the, where's the test? What's the, what's the one thing? Is it the Howey test? What is this Howey test uh, concept? And, and what are the things should entrepreneurs didn't know about? Right, so I think um, you know, the Howey test is you know, a test that was in case law that basically explains what is an investment contract. And an investment contract is what is considered a security. So basically the payment of money, um, you know, based on the efforts of others where you kind of have the reasonable expectation of obtaining profits, right, from those efforts of others versus yourself. So that's the general gist of it. Um, so I think from a securities law perspective, that's really important because there has been so much focus from the SEC. Um, but there's also other regulatory agencies who are focused on this. Some of those are, you know, money transmitter laws. Um, you know, there's potential commodities law issues. So there's, there's definitely other regulatory regimes that could um, implicate the token or the token could be implicated in that regime. But I think the securities law one yeah. is one that I focus on yeah. um, and it's important to look at. All right, so the, so the first test is, okay, obviously new internet infrastructure, mm -hmm. different conversation, but the real law test is, is this token going to be an investment? Right. Making money? Right. Or is it going to be a utility, one that provides values to the participants? Did right. I get that right? Is that the four? Yes, people? I would say generally speaking, right? Is, is the token, you know, is it a use case or is it an investment, right? Am I expecting profits from yeah. that token or am I using it like an access fee or a membership yeah. or, you know, to an obtain services? Game as Grant, exactly. As Grant Fonda an arcade say. game is probably your, your best example. Yeah. Um, okay, so then the next test is I've heard some things I'd like to get you to explain mm -hmm. um, what anti-money laundering or AML is yep. and KYC, yep. know your customer. Uh, and obviously Bitcoin has been kind of, you know, we've heard Silk Road stories on belly, a lot yeah. of bad things are happening, but anonymous is good, but here, financially, know your customer is a specific thing that means something, and then AML, anti-money laundering. Mm -hmm. How does that factor into this whole thing? Yeah, so I think for, um, you know, when you open a bank account, for example, right, your bank wants to know who you are, 
Um, they'll obtain certain information from you, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's your driver's license or passport, um, where you obtained your funds. I mean, that's part of the know your customer anti-money laundering um, activity. Right? An identity behind the face right. side of thing. So part of it is because cryptocurrency can be very anonymous, right? They're anonymous wallets that you're sending cryptocurrency to and from. You don't know who these people are. So part of it is making sure that you understand who your purchasers are. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to run afoul of, you know, anti-terrorist type, you know, regulations. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. government has several lists that, you know, they have online that you can search for names of folks that, you know, you don't need to be doing business with. So there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of structures already in place, and part of that is just understanding And these are requirements on, are. on certain things, and the anti-money laundering, I suppose, is just audit trailing and certain things that you got to have as a compliance thing, Correct, right? correct. Okay, and so, so I think in, the, in America, you know, we don't normally, I would say, you know, if you were kind of outside of the U.S., this is probably a little bit more um, normal, right? It's, people are used to doing it. Mm -hmm. I think in America, you know, maybe we're not as used to it, um, but these are not, you know, kind of new guidelines. This has al always existed. All right, so sometimes entrepreneurs are fast and loose with their, ah, screw the anti-money yeah. laundering thing. Or they get, I don't understand, that's too much work, I don't understand yeah. it, so they blow it off. When do they have to not blow it off? <laughs> when do you have to worry about, like, all these anti-money or laundering things, because you have to obviously do more work. Right. Got to you know make sure you're checking the boxes, right. complying. That probably has overhead, cost money, or maybe yeah. write some new software. So we've been recommending that all of our clients who are in the token space and kind of obtaining you know digital currency go through KYC and AML. Um, some of the digital currency con you know exchanges, right? So in order when you're receiving your digital currency and you need an account mm -hmm. in order to exchange the digital currency into U.S. dollars, mm -hmm. for example, um, it's essentially like a b opening a bank account. So they're going to ask for all of you know the information with respect to how did you you know receive your digital currency. So part of that is you need to have that in place prior to actually launching your token sale so that you can kind of follow the flow of funds. So I was, I was trying to find this image I would send, put up, but I can't find it because that's not, I'm on this computer, but I saw a thing on a conference, might have been BlockCon that um, you guys were at, I think you guys sponsored that event, or might have been one in Europe, where the cost of doing an ICO can range from, they said on the cheap end, they use the word cheap, not inexpensive, cheap, probably implying not get a good lawyer, <laughs> uh, 100K up to $750,000. So range of cost between 100,000 and 750,000 from cheap to right. done right, right or expensive. Right. Um, is that um, right or is that, what's the cost range? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of players in the ecosystem, right? So there's the, l the lawyers. Um, and you know, typically lawyers bill by the hour, so it's kind of <laughs> how much time you know we're we're looking at documents and, and things and helping you structure. There's yeah. the tax accountants, so part of that is also you know how much time they're spending. But some of it can be very complicated from a tax structuring perspective. Um, then there's you know the technical people, right? Unless you have that in house to actually build your blockchain network. Um, kind of help you with all of that, you know, the technical aspects of it. Um, so software engineers, for example. Um, then there's the ICO consultants, you know, someone to kind of help you manage, quarterback the process, you know, maybe help you with marketing, um, mm -hmm. you know, the tokens um, to, you know, certain different, you know, websites or, you know, help you with that. So mm -hmm. all of those together, I mean, yes, it can be very expensive. It kind of depends on how much of that you want to outsource and how much of that, you know, you can do yourself. You know, you obviously you can't really do so the it's in the range. It yeah. could be in the ranges. I mean, tax I, I alone so. could kill you if you're looking at all kinds of complicated schemes right. or licensing agreements. Right. I mean. So all that, you want to make sure you're, you're structuring the entity appropriately before you start it. Okay, so where do you get involved? So let's just say, let's just walk through the, the, the day in day operations yeah. of, of say Goodwin. Okay, I've yeah, got a client and yep. okay, you come in for the securities component. What does that mean? You just make sure they're incorporated properly, all the laws on the uh, stock and then the tokens treatment. What specific things do you do? Sure. So, you know, once we kind of have brought the client in, you know, after our conflicts procedures and we've, you know, agreed, agreed to the engagement, um, part of it depends on where they are. If they are, if they don't have a company, you know, we'll help you form the company, right? Mm -hmm. And make sure that all of those startup, um, documents have been appropriately done. Sometimes people have already, they're, you know, uh, an actual company, right? Mm -hmm. We don't need to, f to form them, they're already in existence. So then we look at, you know, past the formation items and we look at the token, um, the token issuance. So we'll look at your white paper. Yeah. Um, the white paper typically describes how the token works in the ecosystem and kind of what, what the you get involved in that, the, yes. just kind of check if it's from a high level, from a structuring perspective, right? Do yeah. we think this is a security, yeah. or do we think it is, you know, leaning towards utility? And the SEC obviously has not said, you know, what yeah. is a utility and what is a security. So, so that's the gray area. Is, yes. So the gray area is watch the language. Don't yep. be careful what you say. 
But also what you do, right? It's not just what you say, it's also what you do. So yeah. part of it is talking to the clients about yeah. what, you know, what are you thinking? How, how are you envisioning this? Um, where can we help you kind of restructure or decrease your risk? Yeah, and you guys become a safety net help defend that too, obviously, as attorneys, but the clients still own the, Correct. The, the, the I mean, part of it is, you know, we, we, are, we give you advice, mm -hmm. right? And the clients can take or not take our <laughs> advice, but that's what we're here for. Do, do you guys offer legal opinions behind these? I'm sure um, you don't. We, we don't <laughs> offer legal opinions. You know, we do do research memos uh -huh. on, yeah. you know, kind of what, where we think your token lies, but we yeah. don't do legal opinions. So have you guys talked to the SEC at Goodwin? I mean, you guys have conversations. I mean, I'm, I don't know how to, what goes on behind the curtain of the big law firms, but I'm assuming that you guys are up to speed on all the file and all the notes and everything, but do you guys actually talk to people at the SEC or do you guys, is that how it works? I mean, because this is a cutting edge year. I'm sure mm -hmm. you guys have to be on the cutting edge. Yeah, I mean, we haven't had any clients knock on wood that have had to go through, um, you know, any of the, the SEC uh, investigations on this. So, you know, we have not had, you know, on behalf of our clients, had to talk to them about it. So, so that's good news. You yeah. guys are doing good. Yeah. And you, I know you guys are doing like over, over more, close to 30 plus ICOs, so congratulations. Is there a pattern that you've seen from a, from a legal mm -hmm. standpoint that you've seen emerging? Obviously, it's pretty clear out in the marketplace, certainly the celebrity endorsement Paris Hilton to the boxer dude and all kinds of stuff was going on where people were endorsing um, right. things. So kind of, I don't want to say pump and dump, but it's a word that's been used in the dot-com bubble, but people are saying a lot of these things are scams and right. the majority of them aren't going to work out. So, you know, we've said editorially here on the Cube and Silicon Angle that failure doesn't mean scams. We have some failures, but certainly there are some scams. Mm -hmm. So um, has that caused people to pull back a little bit and say, whoa, we're not going to go forward fast enough or is nothing stopping this? What's, uh, what's yeah, the pattern? Yeah, I mean, I would say from, you know, compared to a year ago where, um, you know, there was no SEC guidance, right? And th there was no guidance from, you know, kind of other regulatory agencies. Yeah. Um, people were definitely going very quickly. I think now what we're seeing um, are more sophisticated clients, mm -hmm. um, clients who really want to make sure that they're following you know, all of the legal requirements to the best that they can, right, given the mm -hmm. grayness in the securities laws and other regimes. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, a lot more of a thoughtfulness about, well, let's make sure that this, this works, right? We're not going to get into trouble. Have you seen any co-mingling between some of the traditional VC, venture capital investors or hedge funds that are emerging? Uh, who want to come in and participate so on the pure equity side, either preferred stock or, or common, mostly prefer we see them, but also also play in the tokens. Is there coexistence between participation or is it mostly they line up on the preferred and then let the tokens go here? Is there a pattern there that you see around how the, those securities are playing out? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, see value, right, in the token ecosystem and they want to participate in that. And a lot of our venture capital clients or our token clients who have VC investors, um, they want to participate. Um, so we, we are definitely seeing people, you know, have, are very excited about it and, and want to kind of be a part of it. What about the pre-sale uh, concept? We're seeing a lot of people jump on the pre-sale mm -hmm. bandwagon because it allows them to, you know, it's not a inexpensive process. You guys obviously don't work for free. Right. You guys have deals where obviously startups can come in and you guys have a good, great startup program and can testify that you guys do have a good, you know, good, good community participation there. But at the end of the day, this is a legitimate process now. Mm -hmm. it, it costs money. Mm -hmm. You guys have to get paid and service providers like the tax attorney's got to right. get paid. So there's a lot, we see a lot of entrepreneurs doing this pre-sale where they try to offer this kind of discount. How is that working out and has that been going well? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, while the SEC has not commented on this, um, the, you know, practitioners and kind of the ecosystem, um, most people, I think, are considering that pre-sale agreement prior to a network actually being live as a security. And so people are going out to accredited investors, you know, sometimes that's VCs, sometimes that's, you know, high net worth individuals. Mm -hmm. um, that's usually done through a SAFT, which is, you know, stands for Simple Agreement for Future Tokens, or a pre-sale contribution agreement. So part of that is it's let's you know it's it's like a you can liken it to it's a, a known preferred process. stock financing, but not, it's not preferred stock. Right? But it's, it's a known correct. it's a known vehicle for financing. Correct. It's not like it's tied to the ICO in, in a new vehicle. It's just like okay, we're going to do something down the right. road. There's risks associated, all that stuff. Right. It's disclosed. an investment contract. I'm giving you a million dollars, right, to invest to build out the platform. At the end of you know when the platform right. launches and hopefully when the network has utility and your token has utility, yeah. then you'll receive tokens. And this is good for innovation because it gets everyone rolling a little bit. Is that kind of seems to be the pattern that I'm seeing. It's like, you know, let's it's get It's basically like a seed round, right? That's, that's probably a really yeah. good example. Is it's a seed round to get something yeah. started. That thing is not your company, it is yeah. you know, your network. And it also sets the community. I mean, I've noticed on the blockchain, these ICO communities are a very big part mm -hmm. of it. Um, Goodwin's got a great reputation, certainly here in Silicon Valley and you know, and around the world as a law firm. 
this is a big part of it. So the pre-sale is also kind of a gesture of credibility for the opportunity. And I think, I mean, I, you know, people I talk to like, hey, I look at what's going on in the pre-sale kind of as an indicator of who's involved, judged by the company that you keep kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's interesting. Have you seen that pre-sale dominating more than just going right to the ICO, given the market conditions of the, <laughs> the ICOs? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends, right? Some of our clients have existing businesses, right, where the it, this is yeah. very complementary. The the blockchain network is complementary to their existing business, and so they may not need to have this big presale, right? Part of the presale um, could be, you know, two weeks before your your general crowd sale, yeah. um, you have folks who kind of get in early. Um, to me, that is not necessarily. I mean, it really depends. It's obviously fact specific, but that's a little bit different than doing a quote presale agreement like a year before six months before yeah. your, your token launch. That, that's a little bit different. Yeah, so also you brought up a good point, existing businesses versus kind of like um, people who just need the cash to get going. Right. We're seeing a lot of companies that either have a successful business like Kick, and then mm -hmm. the Kin token was one example we, we talk about all the time. The other one is pivots. We're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs take companies that were pivots, AKA going out of business, where the token timing of a token and decentralized mm -hmm. blockchain actually is great for their business model and they have to essentially go recap or do some securities, you know, resetting. Mm. That's your world, right? You got to get involved in those areas. Yeah, I mean, I think anything that has to do with kind of changing your capital structure, right? You should have your securities lawyer, your corporate lawyer involved because that that'll obviously, you know, impact your securities laws. Um, mm -hmm. You know, exemptions that you're taking, you know, typically from a private placement exemption mm -hmm. uh, for most of our private company clients. Is there any new trends that are popping out of that kind of pivot or, wow, this is really, you know, it's out there. I got some, you know, funding from Y Combinator or some sort of venture and we're kind of just barely staying alive, but oh, oh, this blockchain can really accelerate, there's now momentum. Is there any trends that you see from your work standpoint, work product where you have to, that are happening that are obvious right. new things that are coming out of this? Is just, or is a standard recap the cap table, normal corporate work? Is it well, I mean, I think there is a tension, right, between um, doing a normal, you know, stock finance, preferred stock or common stock financing, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you would typically do, whether that's a convertible security or convertible note, and then, you know, raising funds through a token sale, yeah. right? And so from, from my perspective, it's obviously cleaner to do it the traditional way, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not dealing with unclear SEC rules, right? Yeah. Be, you know, it's, it's very clear how you do a preferred stock financing. Yeah. We do that every day. Um, so to the extent that, you know, companies are in that position where they can choose, it's certainly cleaner yeah. to do it the traditional way. If you pull off an ICO, God bless you. It's, it's a new, I mean, certainly equity free tokens. Right. There's no equity to token, if you're a utility token. Right. Okay, so I, I was reading about the uh, Delaware, um, corporate uh, Delaware was allowing companies to use blockchain. Mm -hmm. This is right up your alley. Mm -hmm. So they're not doing ICOs. So can you clarify the Delaware situation relative to blockchain? Because they're using a blockchain from a ledger standpoint, but there's right. no IC, it's not an ICO haven yet. So talk about Correct. the Delaware so situation. So the Delaware um, amendments, which I believe um, uh, are now approved as of a couple of months ago over the summer, essentially allow the cap table ledger to be on the blockchain. So it's, you know, they're kind of ahead of everything, right? Because, yeah. you know, so for like, for example, a few years ago, no one had, you know, uncertificated stock certificates. Everybody wanted the, the physical stock certificates. <laughs> yeah. And now most companies that we represent, they you know, have, exactly, digital uncertificated stock certificates, but there is a ledger and there, there is yeah. a, there's a record of it. You're, you just don't have the fancy paper with the pretty legend on it. So yeah. I think, you know, technology is moving and yeah. the law needs to as well. So yeah. part of that is, you know, Delaware kind of getting, getting on board. Yeah, um, Delaware's got a great opportunity to nail the ICOs. Well, Mitzi, thanks for coming in. Really appreciate it. Any other observations that you'd like, that you see in the market that you'd like to share. Take a minute to talk about what you're doing at Goodwin as well. What's going on? What's happening? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's a really exciting time. We're really excited to be a part of it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's cutting edge work. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, there's there's a lot of, um, I guess, what, what I would call kind of your more traditional clients that mm -hmm. we have, that uh, we take calls from every day, whether that's investment banks or, mm -hmm. you know, VC funds, private equity funds, or just, you know, our venture-backed companies that you know are are curious as to what what is this all about. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really exciting, and and I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, I don't think that it is going to stop. I think that certainly there's likely to be more regulation about how you yeah. do one of these ICOs, one of these token generation events, you know, within the confines of the law. But I don't see it stopping. You don't see it stopping at all. No. I mean, I think you know once there's more regulation, there'll be more clarity about how to do yeah. it. 
um, and how to do it within the confines of the law, which we try to do, obviously, you know, given that there's not yeah. a ton of clear guidance. But I think that I think the ship has sailed. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is a great conversation here with uh, Goodwin, formerly Goodwin Proctor, Mitzi Chang, partner. She's a securities attorney. We should, we could, we should call the show Billable Hours because <laughs> we're getting some free uh, legal uh, opinions and conversations. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Blockchain is hot. Entrepreneurs are using it. All the top tier one entrepreneurs are looking at this as a great opportunity, similar to the Web 1.0, the TCP IP era of the internet, blockchain, uh, is fundamental infrastructure for the future decentralization. So great opportunities, causing lots of innovation. Check with your attorneys, obviously Goodwin and a few others all doing great ICOs, great potential fundraising, but also great business opportunity. Thanks again, appreciate it. Thank you. It's theCUBE Conversations here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.